the topic. Well, everybody, um, it's uh, 9.30, and it's time for our, our forum. This forum, which is uh, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Academy, it's entitled uh, The History of Engineering Over the Past 50 Years and Look Forward. I really thank you all for coming, and I thank uh, our, our speakers, which are, are going to make very interesting presentations for us. Hey, Rod, the doctor is in. Good, thank you very much. Uh, here t today, um, the, the, uh, the, the speakers, of course, have had a chance to look at our, our, uh, our essay book, and they have their own experiences from their domains. They represent different domains uh, of interest of the NAE, and uh, I'm sure that their stories will be very uh, uh, poignant, entertaining, and quite fun, as a matter of fact. I, I, uh, we have for this forum, which we start at 9.30, we have a, a break in it. There'll be, uh, of course, panelists' remarks, and then there'll be uh, uh, discussions, and I'll introduce the people in a second, and there'll be a break at 11 o'clock, 11.15, and then we will essentially close out at uh, about 12.30. Now let me introduce the speakers, which I believe it's from, it's from my end here, from left to right, uh, very briefly. We have Wanda Thank Austin. You. Wanda, just give him the wave. Give him the wave. Good. Wanda Austin's president and CEO of the Aerospace Corporation. Uh, she's a member of Section 1, Aerospace Engineering, and, and of course a member of the National Academy of Engineering Council. Wanda's uh, dedicated to inspiring the next generation of engineers. Next to her, Coralie Brierly. Coralie is a, is a founder of Brierly Consultancy, the vice president of the National Academy of Engineering, and a member of Section 11, Earth Resources Engineering, and chairs the NRC Board on Earth Sciences and Resources. Her husband, Jim Brierly, is also a member of the NE, and Coralie spends more time underground than she does above ground. Uh, ne next to her, Leonard Kleinrock. Len? Uh, he's a distinguished <coughs> professor in computer sciences at UCLA, a member of Section 5, Computer Science and Engineering. He was a developer of ARPANET uh, way back when, and a founding member of the NRC Computer Science and Telecommunications Board. Leonard, thank you very much for coming. Next to him, Bob Lucky. Robert Lucky was vice president of applied research at Belcor, then Telcordia. He's a member of Section 7, Electronics, Communications, and Information Systems Engineering. His textbook was the most cited reference in communications field for over a decade. Next to him, uh, Arun, Aruneva, or Arun Majumdar. He is the J. Precourt Professor at Stanford University, a member of Section 10, Mechanical Engineering. He's a member of the NAE Council as well. He was a founding director of the Advanced Research Projects Energy ARPA-E for three years. Next to him is Roderick Pettigrew. Rod Pettigrew is director of the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering. He's a member of Section 2, Bioengineering, and also the Institute of Medicine. He is the chair of the Bioengineering Peer Committee and a member of the Russ Prize Committee. Rod? Uh, Thank you. Next to uh, Rod, <coughs> Bob Shafrick. Bob, are you there? Yeah, great. <coughs> Bob Shafrick was general manager of the Materials and Process Engineering Department of General Electric Aviation, and he's a member of Section 9, Materials Engineering. He chairs the National Materials and Manufacturing Board. And finally, our moderator, uh, Ollie Velchi. He's a host of Real Money with Ollie Velchi. Is that real money from Ollie Velchi? <laughs> <laughs> real, real money to Ollie Velchi? Uh, uh, on on Al, Al Jazeera America. He returns for the third time to moderate our annual meeting forum. His thoughtful, moderating, and engaging personality have ensured successes in each of these forums before us. So, Ollie, thank you very, very much for coming, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Dan. <clears throat> thank you so much, Dan. Thank you. Uh, glad to be back with you. Uh, I, I'm quite certain, I'll be giving out money at the end of the session, by the way. Uh, I'm quite certain the only reason I get invited back to this uh, August group is because I don't understand anything that's being discussed, so I can't cut anybody off, and uh, they keep getting me back because I can just let this thing go. I, it's an honor of mine to be here. I actually learn a great deal. Uh, I, uh, I'm a, not a member of any sections here. Uh, they would never have let me, this is as close as the engineers ever let me to anything engineering. 
Uh, however, I, I do have to tell you about a little bit of the engineering of this building, and that is for safety requirements, just so you know. It's a big room. Uh, if there's any reason to get out of here, you got two exits here, two exits at the back, and one over there that you've mostly been using. So please identify the exit closest to you, and for the rest of the uh, ride, sit back and enjoy. <laughs> uh, I uh, want to let you know that uh, we're being videotaped, so anything you say will be recorded. Uh, the only thing I can try and hope that that encourages you to do is for all the forums I discuss, this one has the panelists who speak the longest and the questioners who ask the longest questions. Uh, <laughs> so you may find uh, that I, I might get up at some point and ask you if there's actually a question in there. So think about that <laughs> ahead of time. <laughs> You guys tend to deliver theses as opposed to questions, but they're all very, very interesting. I must say, I learn a great deal. They're, they're, uh, they're a little bit hyper-specific sometimes, but that's okay. Um, our, uh, our panelists will speak to you uh, for, uh, I believe, seven to 10 minutes. They believe 10 or more minutes each. Um, and I will call upon them uh, in alphabetical order based on their last name. Uh, they will speak for as long as they speak, I will uh, gesticulate and wave and try and, you know, ask them to wrap it up. But the bottom line is they'll speak for as long as they speak for. And then, depending on the time and your jumpiness, we will either begin a, a little bit of a discussion with them or, or we'll take a quick break. I'll, we'll determine that when we get there. But either way, what will happen is we'll have a little bit of a discussion. And then, of course, uh, this is for you. So we will open up the floor to you. I see two microphones. I believe that's uh, the case. So they're over here. It'll be most orderly if you ask your questions from there. Also remember, because we're being videotaped, we need the audio. So please, uh, please do that. Uh, I think that takes care of uh, my responsibilities. I want to get you right to your panelists. So uh, let us please begin with Wanda Austin. Well, good morning. It's truly an honor for me to be here as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of NAE. So I want to thank Dan um, certainly for the uh, panel and for the opportunity. And Ali, it's going to be a pleasure watching you gesticulate to try to get people off the stage. So we'll look forward to that. Uh, but this is a, a significant milestone that we've achieved. And uh, it's one that I think is really worth taking time to step back and have some discussions looking back as well as looking forward to where we're going. Um, as all of you know, we in the engineering profession don't typically like to spotlight our mistakes. In fact, you know, we have an aura of infallibility, maybe even a little bit of magic that we perform, which is crucial to business success in our field. So, this may sound a bit unusual to you, but I want to talk a little bit about how hard what we do is, how hard it is uh, to do engineering. And in fact, systems engineering of aeronautics is very hard. It's tremendously rewarding, but ultimately, in, in my business, it's a very unforgiving field because uh, if you don't have success, you have failure. So success isn't just expected, it's absolutely required. In the 90s, the aerospace industry experienced six launch failures, a significant amount given the cost and national importance of the space assets we support. It was a very difficult time for all of us in the industry, and we were facing real adversity were, and were in fact in need of real solutions. On this day of celebration, you may be wondering why I've chosen to lead with material of this nature. Um, the reason is very simple, and one that's embodied in a well-known quote from writer George Santayana. He said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Every one of our launch failures led to significant learning and lasting improvements in the way we do business. We took a good, hard look at ourselves and improved our infrastructure, our efficiency, and our processes. As a result, we have benefited from an unprecedented string of launch successes since 1999. That's a total of 96 successful launches over the course of 15 years. Just last month, we were able to support two successful launches out of Cape Canaveral in only four days. These are the expendable Evolve uh, launch vehicles. Major accomplishment. Since the year 2000, 
We've reinvigorated every mission area, including communications, navigations, and space-based sensors. Our Earth observing assets have provided mounds of new data, enabling us to learn more about ourselves and our galaxy every day. We currently have a host of fascinating scientific capabilities on orbit, including the Cassini-Saturn orbiter, the Moon Mapping Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and most recently, MAVEN. We also continue to gather groundbreaking data from NASA's Mars Curiosity, now which innovatively studies the composition and climate of one of our most intriguing planetary neighbors. At Aerospace, we've been able to take the lessons we've learned in the 90s and apply them to mission success today. We share the lessons that we've learned from military, civil, and commercial space. As you can see, challenging circumstances, when approached correctly, can be a tremendous catalyst for innovation. The entire space industry relies upon innovation and the development of new technology to solve complex engineering problems. New ideas aren't usually developed in isolation. Collaboration is at the core of progress in this business. We regularly partner with government organizations, private companies, and universities on a wide variety of projects. Over the past few years, we've worked with SpaceX on their effort to become certified to be awarded US Air Force missions. SpaceX is one of the, is one of the participants in the growing commercial space sector. As an example of one of our more science-based collaborations in the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite Test, which was developed by MIT and NASA, TESS is a space telescope designed to locate and observe the most promising Earth-like planets in our celestial sky. The plan is for TESS to discover potentially life-supporting planets and then to use high-powered telescopes like the James Webb Space Telescope to characterize and evaluate their compositional makeup. It sounds difficult to believe, but tests may very well be the piece of technology that discovers extraterrestrial life in our universe. It's scheduled to launch in 2017. TESS is an example of what's possible on a very grand scale, but seemingly modest achievements in space are equally critical to innovation. The CubeSats shown on this slide were built by aerospace and are the result of 20 years of research, development, and test. The functions that can now be accomplished with CubeSats include propulsion, imaging, sensing, and attitude control. The missions being executed by CubeSats and other small satellites can also serve to educate, and these missions are sometimes very dramatic. For example, this photo is a shot taken by one of our CubeSats of the last flight of Shuttle Atlantis. It is impactful, especially when one realizes that first, it's a photo of a vehicle in orbit, and second, it was taken by a device that you can hold in the palm of one hand. The photo enhances our ability to inform and educate it, and not just within our industry, but with the general public, our elected officials, and in the minds of our youngest citizens. These small satellites and others like them are also changing the face of space business, allowing exciting new companies into the commercial sector. Just a few months ago, Google announced that it plans to pay $500 million to acquire Skybucks Imaging, a company that uses small, low-cost satellites to take high-resolution images and video of planet Earth. Other companies, including Planet Labs, are creating a tremendous amount of excitement among investors and venture capitalists. As you can see, the business potential for small satellites is anything but small. Advancements in space technology also continuously create new opportunities for cutting edge developments right here on Earth. Recently, an aerospace scientist was awarded a patent for a laser scripted bone growth implant. This patent might sound surprising coming from aerospace, but it is an example of how innovation for aeronautics 
intersects with innovation for bioengineering. Scientists who was working with lasers for many years to build infrared sensors that harness the power of highly sensitive nanoparticles realized that the same laser processing technique could be reused as the foundation for the development of medical implants, primarily for the spine. This realization resulted in the invention of an entirely new technology, which has the potential to change lives and expedite the healing and recovery process. All of the innovative efforts I've just mentioned helped to shed light upon the complexity and depth of the technology developed by the space industry. Our work touches every sector in our society and most importantly, serves as a catalyst for innovation. Before I conclude, I'd like to say one last word about adversity. It's my firm belief that in order to create anything of value, we must not be afraid to fail, to make mistakes, or to change the status quo. It's my experience that challenges can always lead to opportunity. I've observed that teams succeed and teams fail. Teams that never fail probably have missed opportunities. And teams that achieve great success do so by learning from failure and developing a strategy to respond to failure. It reminds me of a famous quote by Albert Einstein. Anyone who's never made a mistake has never tried anything new. Truer words could not be said of the space business. Our work pushes the boundaries of technology and human invention. In order to maintain the status quo, we must continually transcend it. So as we look to the future in our pursuit of innovation, there will always be challenges. But as we learn from those challenges, we also deliver tremendous benefit to humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Wanda Corley. Good morning. It is no exaggeration at all to say that everything we depend on is either made from Earth resources or relies on Earth resources for its production and distribution. I give you some examples. Oil and gas. They are used for our transportation, provide 27% of our electrical power. Groundwater. 30% of the fresh water on Earth is as groundwater, and it's our supply of drinking and irrigation water. Geothermal, it's an emerging source of our renewable energy. The subsurface, we use it for storage and disposal of our wastes as repositories. We also use it for our transportation. Coal and uranium, the energy minerals, supply us with electrical power, 39% and 19% respectively. We mine for sand and gravel for our construction, and we use copper for construction and electrical and other uses. Rare earth elements are used in our electronic materials that we, that we manufacture. Our fertilizers are mined, potassium, and, and phosphorus. And yes, ladies, guess what? Our makeup is formulated using mined products. In the last 50 years, indisputably, hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling has radically changed the way we think about our own energy sources. In Making a World of Difference, you can read about these particular technologies. We have, there we go, we've used the hydraulic and also for deep water drilling. We've used these technologies to be able to obtain our petroleum 10,000 feet of water and then two to five miles deep in the Earth's surface below that 10,000 feet of water. We have developed the continuous miner, 
which has made coal mining efficient and cleaner and safer for our workers. We have developed tunnel boring machines in the last 50 years. The one shown in this slide is Big Bertha, which is the largest tunnel boring machine that's ever been developed. And when you look at what happened in 1970, Love Canal was something that told us about groundwater that we did not know, and that is, is that we have to be extremely careful about what we put on the soil because it can pollute our groundwater. And from that, we learned how to analyze different contaminants and how they are transported in the subsurface. In mining, I would have to say there's a lot of innovation, but I'm going to point to a couple of them. One is the solvent extraction that was developed, which allows us to mine and process much, much lower grade materials for sustainable production of minerals. When you couple solvent extraction with electrowinning, it produces a, a copper product that is 99.999% pure. And this has led to another technology that actually Frances Arnold alluded to yesterday in, the, in her presentation, and that is, is that we now have developed biomining processes where we use microorganisms to actually extract certain metals. So today, 80% of our copper is still produced by conventional technologies like uh, smelting, but 20% is now produced by microorganisms. So how did that happen? It turns out that in some small measure, it was the result of a young lady who grew up on a cattle ranch in Montana and rode her horse Betty to a one-room country schoolhouse. She wanted to go to college for one reason, and that is because she absolutely hated cleaning the chicken coop. And her mother told her that, honey, if you would go to college, and if you'd marry the right man, that you won't have to ever clean another chicken coop. So she went to college, and she met the right man. Uh, he happened to be a PhD student at the time, and so together they were working on the microorganisms in hot springs in Yellowstone National Park. And it turned out that many of the microorganisms that they were studying turned out to be extremely important in the mining industry. So they got married, and they also continued to do publishing together, uh, and also a lot of development work that eventually came to be used in producing to what is about 20% of the world's copper today. Uh, for their contributions, they were elected to the National Academy of Engineering. So let's look at some of the technologies that we need in the next, and what I expect in the next 50 years. In situ mining is going to be one of the most important technologies in mining because we need to reduce the footprint that we create on the surface because of higher populations that's encroaching on mine sites. We need to, the, the in situ technology will also reduce the amount of waste that we have to uh, produce. Uh, it will be safer uh, and more sustainable. Now, we, we already do some in-situ mining, uh, but for many metals, we're going to have to develop new technologies that allow us to see in the underground. We already have some great technologies, but they all have limitations. Uh, Secretary Jewell talked about satellite imagery, and I've shown one here that shows where the actual vent is in, in a volcano. We also have ground penetrating radar, and we can look under Stonehenge and actually find things that are under Stonehenge that we didn't know were there. We have 3D seismic technology, which has been a big help, and we also have uh, drill bits that are intelligent drill bits. You know what the problem is with these technologies? They can't see more than a few feet in front of them in real time. What we need is a Google map of the Earth, the interior of the Earth, so that we can see the geological and structural features underground. And we need to see these things in real time. What we need is biomedical technology 
that's applied to the earth. We also need to have technology where we can assess the placement and displacement of fluids just like we do in medicine and surgery with the kinds of precision that we can see those things. If, that, if we had that technology today, Big Bertha would not be stuck under Seattle. And apparently Big Bertha doesn't have a reverse gear, uh, but <coughs> what happened is she didn't see an eight inch diameter steel pipe in front of her. If we had transparent earth, and we could see things that we're doing in real time, we could greatly improve our renewable use in enhanced geothermal. We could even moderate or control earthquakes. And we could use that technology for the disposal of CO2 to make a cleaner atmosphere. Thank you. Thank you, Coralie. Leonard Kleinrock. So 50 years ago, when the National Academy was being created, the seeds of the internet had already been sown, and we were thinking about such a network. But the vision for that network came much earlier. In fact, we, we learn of a, a quote by someone you'll recognize in just a moment, who said that a businessman in New York using an inexpensive device no larger than his watch would be able to communicate instantly anywhere across the world on sea or land and transmit print, drawing, text, characters instantly and easily. That, prediction, that man was talking about the internet, but he did so in 1908. Name was Nikola Tesla. So the vision's been around for a while. And in the 40s, in the 30s, H.G. Wells was talking about a world brain, a depot for knowledge. In the 40s, Vannevar Bush was talking about Memex, where we could collect, get our collective memory on a machine. In the 60s, J.C.R. Licklider was talking about man-computer symbiosis. Later in the 60s, I was talking about this network which we were about to build, which would be always on, always available. Anybody with any device could get on at any time, from any location, and it would be invisible. Well, it's not yet invisible, unfortunately. We'll talk about that later. But as we embarked upon the creation of the ARPANET, which led to the internet, as engineers, we had done our homework. We had a theory, a model, we had analyzed it, we knew how it would behave and how to optimize it. But as engineers, we also knew that we didn't know, <clears throat> that we had to experiment with this thing. This was an experimental network. So we built in the measurement tools, basically the ability to generate traffic, to test it, to try to break it, and learn from that experimentation. As we all have done, we know the wonders of engineering come out when you try something and you discover things you didn't anticipate and then find out why they're behaving that way and how to fix it. So the engineering approach to this was critical. It's not as if we designed something, built it, and let it go, because it wouldn't have worked. We needed to correct it along the way. Now, ARPA, Advanced Research Project Agency that came along, decided they needed a network to share the resources, the computing resources, the applications, the services, the hardware among their many researchers. And so they launched upon this network. And what you should realize is that the very early culture that existed in that time was one that was an open culture. It was shared. It we trusted everybody. We knew everybody that was coming into the network. So we didn't put in many impediments, call that security measures, to protect against bad behavior. And in fact, uh, the gratification that we received as engineers was not to build a system to make money, but simply to build a system. As nerds, just building it, and the gratification we got was when other people used the things that we put down and made available. So the network came to life in the late 60s, 1969, and once we had two nodes up, UCLA and Stanford Research Institute, 
we decided to test it. We had a two-node network, so we wanted to send the first message from UCLA to SRI. Now, Samuel Morse, years ago, had sent a great message, what God hath wrought. Alexander Graham Bell, come here, Watson, I need you. Neil Armstrong, a giant leap for mankind. Those guys were smart. They understood public relations. They had photographers. They had, they, they had written documents. They had a record of what they did and a good message. We had no such idea. There was nobody around. There was no camera, almost no written record. And all we wanted to do was log in from one machine to the other. Now, to log in, you have to type L-O-G, and the <laughs> machine at the other end understands what you're trying to do. It'll type the I-N for you. So the job is just type L-O-G. So we had this network, and one of our programmers typed the L, and to be sure it got there, he had a telephone talking <laughs> to the guy at the other end. Now, understand, we're using a technology called telephony to prove a new technology which is going to undermine technology. <laughs> But we needed the old technology to make sure it's So Charlie said, did you get the L? And it came back, got the L. Type the O, get the O, got the O. Type the G, get the G, <laughs> crash. <laughs> <laughs> so the first message <coughs> on the net, the internet, ever was low, as in <laughs> lo and behold. <laughs> we couldn't have asked for a better message, by luck. <laughs> but nobody knows it. Hopefully, someday it'll be as popular as, um, come here, Watson, I need you. So the internet grew very nicely from 1969 to 1988. In 1988, the first worm escaped. And we noticed it. It was all over the place. And we said, uh-oh. And then we said, oh, well, it's an aberration. What a mistake. From 1988 to 1994, things went, fine, went along fine until the first broad spread, widely understood spam message came from a couple of people named Cantor and Siegel. They were trying to sell their services as lawyers to help people get green cards. This was all over the net. We said, uh-oh, and we said, ouch, that one hurts. How dare you use our experimental network, a research network, for commercial reasons? And so we sent messages back to them. We said, you should do that bad, stop, shame on you. We sent so many messages back, we took down their server. So, so the response to the first spam message was the first denial of service attack. <laughs> Inadvertently. So if you think about it, what the internet allows people to do, allows anybody, short, pimply, ugly, dirty, to reach out to millions of people instantly, easily, at no cost in money or effort, anonymously. Well, that's a perfect formula for the dark side of the internet. And sure enough, the dark side emerged as spam began to propagate. And now the technology was different and the world was and is different in terms of the bad things that take place as well as all the wonders. But our younger generation now can't conceive of a time when they couldn't share their photos, chat with their friends, stream video, shop online. <clears throat> and while all that's taking place, there are disruptive forces, technology engineering forces at, at work. For example, everything is getting digitized. That's a disruptive <coughs> event. Basically, the explosion of broadband, wireless and wired. Devices are getting smaller, smarter, faster, cheaper, that's a disruptive technology that we are producing. Mobile applications are changing the landscape, and the Internet of Things is being deployed as we speak. These are not small effects. They certainly change the landscape dramatically. Enormous changes, enormous opportunity. And yet the Internet itself is still a teenager. And it's acting like a teenager. It's mischievous, it's erratic, it's unruly, and it's disobedient. And the hope is that it will mature and grow up into a, a properly behaved adult. We're not sure. We hope it'll happen. So what's the future? The future consists of convergence of content, technology, applications, services, function. We're seeing them converge into devices that we carry around. The future will be one of extreme mobility, mass personalization, 
video addiction, location-based services, surprising apps, and as we know, dramatic society and lifestyle changes. So a reversal has taken place. We've seen a tipping point recently. It used to be that we developed technologies engineers and the applications would follow. Here's a technology, here's an application that can use that technology. <clears throat> Well, these days, over the last few years, we've seen the applications racing ahead of the technology, and technologies chasing behind, trying to catch up to serve the needs of those applications. A serious tipping point has, been, has, has occurred. And yet, the beauty of the design of the network we talk about as the internet today is that it was designed so it would not preclude unanticipated services and applications and technologies. They come, they, the PC wasn't invented, when the internet began, mobile applications weren't there. They all come in and the, the technology is adaptive enough and general enough to allow these things to blossom, if you will. So, applications. Most of these significant applications have come as a surprise. They've hit us in the side of the head. They've suddenly come and taken over. Examples, email, the World Wide Web, peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer sharing networks, social networking, blogs, the ability to users to generate and use and ship around music, photos, videos. So in terms of predicting the technology, we can see what's happening. In terms of predicting the applications, what we can predict is that we'll be unable to predict those applications. And when they come, they're usually surprising and delightful, and they take over very quickly. So in summary, the internet will essentially be a pervasive global nervous system. It will be everywhere, and hopefully at some point, it will be invisible, and you won't have to mess with it. Thank you. Thank you, Leonard. Bob Lucky. About uh, 15 years ago, uh, at the turn of the millennium, I had the great privilege of serving on a committee here of the Academy to pick the most outstanding engineering accomplishments of the last century. In fact, I was thinking this morning, after our last meeting, I walked up to the Foggy Bottom, bottom Metro with uh, Neil Armstrong, mm -hmm. and he didn't have a card for the Metro, and he didn't have any small bills, and we just sat there by the, by the machines, and people were streaming past us, and I said, you walk on the moon, but you can't ride the metro? <laughs> <laughs> the last I saw him, he was walking up the stairs out, and that was it. <laughs> so anyway, so based on the social impact of engineering, we picked the 20 most, imp the greatest achievements of engineering in the last century. You know, it made me really proud to be an engineer. And I look back on that, what an incredible century of change. I think, we did that. I was damn proud, you know, just as an engineer, of what we were able to accomplish. I think in terms of the life of my mother, she, her life almost spanned the century exactly. She was born in 1902 and died in 1998. She grew up on a farm in Virginia with no electricity, no radio, no telephone, you know, and yet, as she told me how when an airplane flew over the farm, what a, what a miracle that was. And yet she lived to see, on television, a man walk on the moon and the rise of the internet. What an incredible century. But will we be able to make the same kind of change in this next century? Or is it possible that there'll be diminishing returns with technological solutions to society's problems? Now, I don't know. But, uh, Perhaps when the next century, when this century <coughs> closes, the NAE will again put together such a list. And they'll look at this century and say what the greatest achievements that we made were. Sadly, none of us will be around to see that list. Um, but I'd like to sort of speculate, what do we know about it now? We're 14 years into this century. And if I look for guidance back to the last century, what did, the, what did we know in 1914 about what the great accomplishments would be of that century? 
And amazingly enough, I divide this into three categories, sort of, in my mind. Things that by 1914 were sort of already there. Things that might have been deduced in 1914 about the rest of the century. And finally, things about no clue whatsoever you never, never could have guessed. And in the first category, things that were sort of already there, um, four of the top five things in our list of achievements were already well underway in 1914. The first one on our list was electrification. Without that, you could have nothing else. But by 1914, power plants were being built all over rapidly. AC power had come into prominence then. Um, second on our list was the automobile. The automobile changed where we live and how we live. Tremendous <laughs> social impact. But the, the Ford brought out the Model T in 1908. So the automobile was there at this time in the last century. Number three on our list was the airplane. But Kitty Hawk was in 1903. So planes were already there. Number five on our list was the radio. But radio had been invented right almost at the turn of the century. And it came into public prominence with the sinking of the Titanic in 1912. So we knew about radio. So right away, there are four things that you already knew about in the year 1914, about what would happen last century. And then there are some things that you might guess at. You think, now we've got a car, we can build highways. And the highway system is on our list. Now that we've got electricity, maybe we can put appliances in the home. Maybe we can mechanize farming. And those, again, are on our list. Uh, now a few other things, too. So you actually knew quite a bit. but. There was no way in 1914 that you could have foreseen the integrated circuit, the internet, the laser. You might guess at computers, you might guess at space travel, but just things that just came about. Now, some of those came about through singular inventions that had tremendous repercussions. I haven't seen any of that yet this century, such as the transistor and integrated circuit, the laser. Um, those kind of transformative <coughs> moments uh, in engineering that just have percolate through the years afterwards. So um, I think, though, that if you ask people in the street, you know, what are the great engineering accomplishments of this century now, they might say, they might give you four names. Uh, Google, Amazon, Twitter, Facebook. <laughs> Those are not technologies. They're companies. <laughs> <laughs> if you would ask someone in 1914 that question, they might have said telephone, radio, whatever. So it's, it's, there's a different mystique. I mean, kind of, like, it's kind of playing with this idea that companies, now it's not technologies, but business ideas and, and company, ideas like that, that can happen. So um, I, it's, I really find it very sad that I won't be around to see what these great accomplishments are going to be. But uh, I could say I'm waiting with bated breath, but my breath will be very bated <laughs> by, by the time the, these, uh, these inventions come about. So we'll all see, and maybe we can talk about what we see now as emerging. And I'll give you a couple things that I see for this century as emerging right now. First, I would say wireless. You know, the last century was a wired century, the telephone, electrification, the cable network, optical fiber, it was a wired. And now we've already had this transformation into a wireless world. And I, I, I would bet that comes on the list. And then there are things that sort of could come about that I could imagine. And I would say um, machine intelligence. We see an emergence of this. And maybe at the end of the century, we'll be talking about machine intelligence going widely distributed around. So that, that's... Uh, that's possible. Possibly 3D printing will transform the way, uh, the way products are produced. So there, there are indications here. But what we know now that we don't know, those will be the miracles that none of us, unfortunately, will be able to see. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Arun Majumdar. First of all, let me first thank Dan, 
Chad and the whole NAE staff who worked so hard to put this show together. Let's give them a big round of applause. So I was asked to talk about energy, but I was also asked to talk about my personal experience during the BP oil spill, and I'll give you a little bit of that if I have, if I have time. So first of all, energy. When we talk about energy, it's very important to put that in the context. And there are three issues that we must address. One is that if it's energy, this is, didn't go quite well. Moses, can you help me? I'm pressing the button. <laughs> Wireless. Thank you very much. Okay, all right. Let's see. Let's restart. Reset button. Three things, very important. Because everything depends on energy in terms of the economy, the three securities extremely important, national security, economic security, environmental security. Now, let's talk about this. Why economic security? We sort of know this. Let me give you some data. If you look at the growth of the GDP per capita, and if you look at the growth of energy use, you can see there's a good correlation. Without the energy, there is no growth of economy. We are back in the medieval ages. So access to affordable energy, extremely important. And so far, it's been mostly fossil energy. Now, national security, economic security are generally considered. The environmental part has been more recent. And we all know about global warming. We all know that the average temperature has gone up by 0.8 degrees from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. But that's the average. Let me talk about the distribution, because I think it's important to note what goes on in the distribution. So environmental security. So here is, I'm gonna show you the summer temperatures, the distribution of the summer temperatures. Some summers are hotter, some summers are colder. How does that distribution move? So here's the movie. This is like the horror movie. So watch it. So some, the red is hot, this is 1950s, 60s, and you'll find an evolution of this distribution, which is a little scary. So the average has moved, certainly, but that's just such a small part of the story. The tail of the distribution, when it reaches four or five sigma, at probabilities that were unheard of, that has a disproportionate effect on our economy, on our lives, on our livestock, etc. So if you, let's do some accounting. The life of a CO2 molecule in the atmosphere is about 250 years or more. So the, C the CO2 molecules that went up in the atmosphere during the times of James Watt are still there. So how much CO2 have you put in there? So it's the cumulative CO2 emissions since the Industrial Revolution, since it's a big capacitor for CO2, that's about roughly a trillion tons in 250 years. If you take all the known reserves of fossil, of fossil energy, known reserves of fossil fuel, and if you burn it all, if you burn all the fossil fuel known reserves, how much more can we emit? It's about three trillion tons. So three times more. Then he asked the question, if business as usual, how long will it take to put the three trillion tons in the atmosphere? The number of years. It's about 75 to 100 years. So three times more in one third the time. That's what we're talking about. Then the question, the economic question comes up, how much is it worth? It's tens of trillions of dollars. So this is the question that is often posed to society. Should we keep our exponential economic growth and ignore the environment, or should we keep the $10 trillion in the ground to save the environment? And that, my friends, is a false choice because it does not account for the human mind to engineer things, and that's where we come in. So, 
the best way to explain this is the Stone Age did not come to an end because we ran out of stones. We just found better solutions. So, so what are those solutions? And are we in a new industrial age right now? Because if the industrial revolution was all about energy, well, we need to create a new industrial revolution. So are there technologies that address all three simultaneously? So we talk about shale. Why is shale so important? Well, this is, you know, this is the map. These are the way the shale reserves are. Because we've increased the production of shale gas, the price of gas has separated from the global price of oil. Very important, because the global price of oil fluctuation depends on international events. The domestic price of natural gas does not depend on that. That's economic security. The carbon emissions have gone down. Because of the shift to natural gas in our electricity sector, and that has gone, brought down the emissions. Finally, if you look, look at where the security issues are, let's look at our imports of fossil fuel. Where do we import it from? The biggest growth in imports is coming from Canada. Mexico is there, Saudi Arabia is there. Well, there's some recent changes in Mexico which might bring in, increase the portion from Mexico compared to Saudi Arabia, and now you have North America as a strategic partnership in terms of energy. Very important. What are the other technologies? I'll give you a few trends. This is the cost of LED in dollars per kilolumens coming down, and within a few years, it is expected it's going to be cost competitive with compact fluorescent lamps. And the growth of the LED uptake is exponentially increasing. Fascinating. Well, what else? The cost of producing electricity from wind is coming down, and the green curve is the growth of wind capacity in gigawatts. So another trend, very similar. The cost is coming down linearly. The adoption is exponential. Solar. The price of solar panels has come down dramatically. In fact, the panel is not the major cost right now. It's the balance of system, and that's over there today. And the uptake is exponential. And in DOE, we created something called the Sunshot Program, just like President Kennedy had moonshot to go to the moon and come back, return in, in the, within the decade safely. This is not to go to the sun and return safely. <laughs> <laughs> this is to reduce the cost of solar <coughs> down to a dollar a watt, fully install the utility scale, and for residential, down to $1.50 a watt. And that would be the cheapest way to produce electricity, and this is without subsidies. Very important. So we are in these trends of cost coming down and an exponential trend going up. Is this part of the new industrial revolution? Maybe. The other one is storage. These are the cost of lithium-ion batteries coming down. 2008, it was $1,000 a kilowatt hour. Today, it's about 400 something dollars a kilowatt hour. And we can see that. And if it comes to about $200 a kilowatt hour in terms of cost, it, the car will be cost competitive with gasoline cars with roughly the same range. Amazing. That's what we've seen. So the electricity system, though, we have, these are components, but the system is very important. And we just heard that the electricity network, the grid, was the greatest engineering achievement of the 20th century. It is the Tesla Edison grid. The architecture is still the same, centralized generation, long distance transmission, and the distribution. Now that you have all these distributed devices, et cetera, what is the new grid? That's a huge challenge. And in fact, that is the grid 2.0, where you have distributed resources and centralized resources, but they all have to be talking to each other. Information, very important. The other part I'll just say is this is the world. Since we're thinking global now uh, and, you know, where the people are, this is the population density. This is where the lights are. There are about 3 billion people who have no or very limited access to electricity. By 2050, another 2 billion people will be added to the same regions that don't have access to electricity. There will be massive levels of urbanization. The question is, do we create, extrapolate the 20th century grid for them, or do we create a new grid? And that's something that we should really think about. Finally, I don't know, how, how much time do I not have? <laughs> you got a minute and a half. Okay, very quickly, biofuels. You know, people think about biofuels as a business, absolutely, there's an uptake, but if you don't remove CO2 from the atmosphere, we're in pretty big trouble. So I, I won't go too much into this. 
I'll talk a little bit about the BP oil spill. And just to give you a context out here, this depends, this belongs to the Department of Interior. When it happened, uh, the president got the cabinet together and I said, talk to Ken Salazar, this is your, but I have a scientist in my cabinet. That happened to be Steve Chu. And I said, Mr. Scientist, Steve, your job is to stop the leak. And so Steve put a team together, small team together, which had National Labs people, amazingly important, very important, the role they played, USGS, and of course, Department of Interior. I shared an office in BP with Marshall McNutt, who was the head of USGS at that time. So what did we go through? There was a, there's a beautiful report from National Academies on what, what it was, you know, why it was caused. And I'm gonna give you a little glimpse of what we actually went through. This is, um, this is what we were trying to do. This is a schematic, beautiful diagram. It's not so pretty down there. It's about a mile deep. And this is a huge blowout preventer where something got jammed, essentially. A tube got jammed out there. And so the question is, there was this big leak 24-7. It was a ticking time bomb, and we didn't have any data. Let me show you what I, what I mean by that. This is the bottom of the BOP out here. This is the bottom. This is the sea floor. And that's the top of the oil leaking out because the tube had bent. And there was a big leak out there, and it was gushing out with methane hydrates. Hydrates are coming out. It's very visible. And he asked the question in this big BOP, how many sensors were there to measure pressure, temperature, et cetera? And one would have thought there's like hundreds of sensors out there, and we get all the data, and we know exactly what's going on. There was one sensor. There's one pressure sensor right out here. And out of the pressure sensor, this is the reading we were getting. It turns out the pressure sensor had a precision of plus minus 400 PSI. <laughs> and an accuracy, it was, there was an offset, we later on found out, an offset of 900 PSI. And we, this is what we were dealing with, and it was a data-free zone. And we had to make decisions, there was email traffic going back and forth and trying to figure out what was going on and what is inside this thing. And there was, remember, in late, this the first thing happened in April 20th, when the blowout happened. By end of May, within a month, BP wanted to do a top kill. The mud was being flown uh, you know, through the choke and kill lines. I won't go into the details. And this was the, this was the expected behavior, that it behaves well, the pressure would come down because you put heavy mud, and the pressure would come down, which is good. But if the pressure went up, it's not good. Guess what happened? It was flat. It didn't make any difference. So clearly, we realized that BP didn't know what was going on. No one knew what was going on. So how do you now address this? There were a lot of suggestions. One of the suggestions, in fact, it came out in articles in Science, that maybe we should put a nuke down there and nuke it, and the whole thing would implode, and that'll be the end of it. <laughs> Luckily, we had some thoughtful minds. <laughs> so I'll give you one example. This is from Dick Garvin. Dick Garvin, I don't know if you knew Dick Garvin. He's a member of the Academy. Um, and he sent, you know, he, he, by the way, he was the guy who enabled the first hydrogen bomb to be built. He's 80 plus years, the sharpest mind on our team. He's an IBM. So he wrote an email at 2.18 2 a.m., June, June 25th, Dear Alex, this is Alex Slocum at, at MIT, who was part of our team. He said, I hope that I wasn't rude, but this is a topic I know a good deal about. He built a hydrogen bomb. <laughs> then he wrote, here are seven pages of Enrico Fermi's hand from my July 1950 Los Alamos notebook, an early calculation of such containment. This was literally Ernie, uh, Enrico Fermi deriving the rankine huguenot conditions for the elastic shock waves. And he sent that out to everyone. He scanned it and he sent it out. He said, I think it's a bad idea. Just go through this derivation. And I looked at that and I got up you know, a little late because I was also up that night. And here's the email I sent back. <clears throat> Stepping back from all the email traffic, the one below is noteworthy on several accounts and will remain in my memory for a while. I never thought I would encounter a historical connection between the oil spill and Enrico Fermi spanning 60 years. <laughs> and I'm awed that Dick has his lab notebooks from 60 years ago, <laughs> and even more so that he remembers where things are in it. 
And this was going on all the time. And I, I won't go into the details. There was a new BOP blowout preventer that was attached on top of it. There were some, I'll, I'll you know, just give you a quick, oh yeah, this is very important. There was, this was a tilt of about four degrees, extremely important because the bolts were at almost yield point out there and we took the risk of it. And then the question is if you stop this thing, will the pressure build up? And if the pressure did not go up, it was a bad news because there were leaks all over. So let me stop here. I see Ali waiting on me out here. So I'm, I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. This is all very good. I'd just as soon not stop anybody, but uh, thank you for that. Rod Pettigrew. Good morning, NAE. <laughs> uh, like Wanda, <clears throat> Uh, I am sin sincerely honored to have been invited to participate in such a historic event. Yesterday, I told Dan that I had approximately 10 minutes of slides, and he said, oh no, you know, no slides. I want to hear personal stories. Uh, so I'm sorry, Dan, I still have slides. But I did compromise, so maybe about six minutes of slides and a few minutes of, of uh, personal journey that you asked about. My topic is engineering and medicine, past and future. And this area, the interface of engineering with biology, life sciences, and the impact that is and can have on medicine has been an area that I've been working in uh, since graduate school and indeed is a labor of love. My first substantive exposure to uh, this interface did come as a graduate student at MIT. I went there specifically because of an exciting project that they were working on that promised to deliver, deliver a therapy for a disease for which there was no treatment. The most serious form of brain cancer, glioblastoma multiforme, and the idea was something out of Star Trek. It involves selectively loading boron 10 into the cancer cells, exposing them to neutrons that are slow, for which boron 10 has a high cross-section, becomes 11 fissions. The fission products share the typical high amount of energy characteristic of fissioning nuclei. And the great thing, though, is that the range of these project, uh, products in tissue is so small that this high amount of energy is delivered only to the diameter of the cell. Bottom line is that this had the theoretical potential of delivering very focused radiation, damage and death, specifically to cancerous cells and not the healthy surrounding cells. At MIT, I developed a strong friendship with another graduate student. In fact, we became best friends. And the thing that brought us together is that we had the same motivation. We both wanted to use science and engineering to improve the human condition. His area was laser physics, and he was a laser spectroscopist. We shared goals, dreams, and hopes. Uh, quite often, he graduated a year before me, went off to pursue uh, his dreams with Howard Hughes, and one day called me and said, you know, NASA is restarting the astronaut program. I'm going to explore that. Became an astronaut, flew, and just before his first shuttle mission, called me and told me that he would be the first person to operate the robotic arm. He did that. And on his second mission, he died on the shuttle Challenger. 
we had spoken many times before that. I visited him many times. And he also visited me in medical school, which I pursued after graduate school. Always encouraging each other to use science and engineering to improve lives, focusing on reducing death, disability, pain, and suffering. This journey that I undertook of working at the interface of biology and engineering was an interface that was accelerating over the, over the ensuing years. We were graduate students in the 70s, uh, and indeed accelerating. And that momentum led to the creation of the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Engineering, which I have the pleasure of directing, fostered and supported heavily by the Whitaker Foundation, and was, I think, officially recognized, or first recognized to my knowledge, formally in writing by this lead article in Technology Review just after the turn of the century, observing that biology and engineering are beginning to cross paths, and the advantages and the impact that this could have, a better understanding and treatment of disease. And indeed, this was underscored just a year earlier by physicians surveyed across the country, asked to rank the relative importance of 30 medical innovations generated over the last 30 years of the 20th century, ranked them, and as you can see, engineering can claim three of the top five and more than half of the top 15 as identified by physicians. Indeed, the top ranked innovation is a consequence of a marvel of engineering, and that is three-dimensional non-invasive imaging of the human body without arm, harm. A quick look at the evolution and history of MRI as an exemplar of this process, I think is both interesting and instructive. Paul Lauterburn and Peter Mansfield shared the Nobel Prize for this achievement. The seminal article introducing the concept that led to MRI is shown in Lauterburn's 73 Nature paper. He had this eureka moment. The phenomenon of nuclear magnetics was, uh, resonance was well known, had not been used for imaging, but he thought if we could vary the magnetic field spatially, this would encode the signal so that a variation in frequency would correspond to location and you can make an image. Concept is shown there, his ability to resolve two small test tubes filled with water. Image is not of a high quality, it's proof of concept for sure. His co-laureate, Peter Mansfield, on the right, first image. This is a note from one of his colleagues who sent me this image. And notice, that he says, we always joke that we are not sure whether this is a finger or a rat, but I think it's the former. It doesn't look like either to me, <laughs> and even in retrospect, I have no idea what this was, but I'll take his word for him. He's an honorable scientist. Somewhat of the medical equivalent of the Rorschach test, one might submit. But the point here is there is no limit to imagination. We know this. And as a result of that, there is no limit to innovation. Starting with this concept, poor image quality but promising, and decades of continuous imagination and innovation led us just 30 years down the road to the ability to produce exquisite images of the human brain without harm like the one you see on the left. And on the right, this inflated image demonstrating not only the area in the brain that's involved in listening to music, but the individual notes can be spatially resolved quite specifically as you see there with A, B, C, D, E, and F. Done with MRI. 
Now, 10 years later, this hot off the press. Initially featured in Science last year, now the cover story just earlier this year in National Geographic. You may have seen this image from Francis Arnold yesterday, what we refer to as tractography. The pathways, the nervous neural pathways in the brain. The interesting thing that I can explain to you, harder to explain to some of my medical colleagues, is that these images of these neural pathways are not directly visualized. They are computed based on the diffusion of water along axonal pathways investigated and quantitatively resolved in 300 isotropic directions. And with this quantitation, based on this high-level tensor diffusion analysis, one is able to visualize these neural pathways. The early theory as to the form in which these pathways were constructed was thought to be more like a bowl of spaghetti. Perhaps not quite as intertwined as you see there, but you get the idea. And what Van Wedeen and his colleagues at MGH, who have developed this technology, have demonstrated is something that has rocked the neuroscience community. Observing for the first time, being able to resolve these fiber pathways at close points, as you can see here, a very simple wiring diagram. It is orthogonal and in sheets and layers, and within each layer, these orthogonal pathways. This is somewhat controversial when introduced last year, but their evaluations in animals looking at high resolution, super resolution microscopy images now supports this. And Van has actually hypothesized why Mother Nature has wired the brain with this grid-like pathway. He suggests that it allows easier navigation. It's easier to genetically tell a developing neuron, continue forward for three seconds, then turn left, and develop that way for two seconds. And that this favors plasticity. So that if an area is dysfunctional, or you need to relearn a task, it is easier to lay down adjacent pathways to the desired target areas of the brain. And what I'd like to conclude with, Ali, this second to the last slide, is a video produced by my institute that shows you very quickly, only 20 seconds each, six other awesome technologies generated by engineers which are making a difference and promise to make a difference in addressing and improving uh, health. This is set to some snappy music. It goes by so fast that I will assist a little bit with some spotty narration here and there. Oh. Oh, here we go. Okay. Now the first segment is an area of regenerative medicine, work that produces a human liver implanted in, in a mouse. It's viable and allows the testing of drugs for potential toxicity without the necessity of having to do this in humans, saving time, money, and lives, as you can see. Biodegradable stents. Stents are part of life. We know that now. They've had a significant impact, but one of the consequences is a high rate of restenosis due to the reactivity induced by the stent. This idea is to dissolve and resorb. The world's smallest MR, handheld, tiny. That's the beginning, but even better news 
is that it has a chemistry platform on it which allows you to detect almost any type of target that you'd like, bacteria, viruses, drugs, at a very high sensitivity at the bedside. First, fully functional Doppler ultrasound capable, portable ultrasound that you can put in your pocket, take it anywhere you go, this modern diagnostic tool goes. Rural settings, disaster zones, the most remote regions, in the world. Bilayer polymer with one layer that changes shape as it absorbs moisture and uses water as a source of energy. And this landmark breakthrough highlighted just this spring of epidural spinal stimulation in individuals who are completely paralyzed with no motor function whatsoever unable to walk, no bladder bowel function, now returning bladder bowel and sexual function, and some voluntary motion. Quite amazing. And continuing. So I, I would like to end with a bit of wisdom here, as our president did yesterday with one of our quotes and circling back to space and exploration, this insight from Robert Goddard, which speaks to why we are engineers. It is difficult to say what is impossible. For the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. And in fact, I would submit and I am certain that one of my mentors in the audience here, Bob Niren, will agree that it is engineers and engineering that make this statement true. It would not be true without engineers because engineers are in the practice of dreaming, harnessing dreams, and turning those dreams into reality, giving all of us hope for a better and brighter future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rod. It's not true that we uh, can't determine what's impossible. Staying within 10 minutes appears to be impossible. <laughs> um, that said, I'd like to introduce Robert Shafrick, who is left with 90 seconds. Okay, well, 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 thank you very much, and it is indeed an honor to be here. And, and I, I must say um, that Al Romig would rather be here uh, himself, but unfortunately his mother passed away a couple days ago, and so Al asked me if I could stand and, uh, and, and give this presentation. So I said, Al, do you have any comments or slides that you'd like me to show? And he says, no, use your own personal experience and go with what you know. So I said, let me try to understand this. I have to talk about the last 50 years of materials and the next 50 in 10 minutes? And he says, yes. So I, uh, I'm, I asked Lance, could I have even a couple more minutes? And he said, no, just go ahead and work it out. <laughs> so, so here it goes. Um, so it is very challenging indeed to foresee uh, like 50 years into the future in, in, in materials, but if the past is a, is a prologue, the future of materials will be quite exciting. And I'll give a few hints of what the possibilities are. The, the, my business you know, has been aircraft engines for a long time, and when I think back to, to 50 years ago, of course I was still undergraduate then at Case Tech, uh, but 50 years ago in, in my company, um, the uh, big activity was developing a new class of engines for the C-5 uh, program that the Air Force had just started. So that was the first wide body uh, transport uh, type airplane of, of, of its time. The engine that was developed was called the TF-39 and ended up being quite a successful engine, it's still flying today in many uh, C-5s, but the commercials, uh, 
derivative of that is, was it became the CF6 engine, which many of you, probably all of you, have flown on airplanes powered by the CF6. It, it's in the 747, the um, 767, well, the Airbus 300, uh, uh, 310, et cetera, those series, over a billion uh, f uh, flight hours. Uh, the big breakthrough with that engine was a 25% improvement in fuel efficiency over, over, over past engines. And uh, in, in a, the, 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 that was due in part to a new change in engine architecture to be a high bypass engine, but also the, the implementation of a lot of new materials. So let me see if I can, oh, you can beat me to it to get the slide. So if, if you notice, you know, by the corner of uh, 1960 there, that was the advent of the engines with the, bi with, with the bypass ratio. And, and if you can, and, and you notice there's been big incremental improvements in fuel efficiency when we change the engine architecture. If you just take the average of fuel efficiency, which is a, key metric in our business. Of course, safety, you know, would be the number one metric. And we also have made great improvements in safety at the same time as we've improved fuel efficiency. But when I talk to the design engineers and say, what is the proportion of that improvement that was due to materials as opposed to other changes in engineering, their estimate is one third to one half. So I'll accept the, the one half as being a, a, a pretty good estimate. Um, I noticed too, though, if you notice a one percent, about a one percent improvement year after year of, imp of of improvement in fuel efficiency, for the next fifty years, that says the engine will generate fuel. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a, so I think that's one of the big challenges for the future. Uh, <laughs> Uh, these engines use the Brayton uh, cycle of, 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 in thermodynamics, which, which, is, which tells you you want to have a high a compression ratio as you possibly can and as high a burning temperature to power the turbine. Uh, so there, there definitely are limits on practically what you could do there, and most of those limits are due from a material standpoint. And, and by the way, in our modern engines, I don't know if you realize, the gas pass temperature in a turbine is several hundred degrees above the melting point of the nickel super alloy that, uh, that the turbine blades, et cetera, are made from. And so what we, what we do is we fool the metal to think it's cooler by, uh, essentially that, that turbine blade is a radiator with a lot of internal cooling passages, plus we put some cooling air on the surface and then there's the insulating layer of ceramic. Uh, so, so designing, developing new turbine alloy, to, uh, uh, turbine blade alloys is really, really hard. Uh, and we reach a limit on what could be possible. We look to the future, we say, well, maybe we should make these out of ceramic materials uh, that, that could have a, a much higher operating temperature. And, you know, we've be begun to do that already. And the new LEAP engine be introduced in service in a couple of years. Uh, it would be the first application of uh, ceramic matrix composites in a turbine section of an engine, but it will not be on a rotating part. It would, would, would be on a, on a turbine shroud where the blade tips, uh, they, they rub against the shroud. Um, so with that background, at least turbine engine-wise, we could say, what, what do we see the real improvements for the future are? Uh, in, in one thing would be the, the Brighton cycle will, will probably go by the wayside, you know, within 50 years. And, and there's a lot of concepts for new engine cycles that would be more efficient. Uh, one of the intriguing ones would, would be to have, the, have a number of, uh, of small fans along the leading edge of the wing of, of the airplane, and each fan would be powered by a... a electricity that, that's conducted by uh, a, a wire of superconductivity type of a material, so you'd have low loss, and you'd have the, a, a turbine engine that essentially would be an electrical power generator. And, 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 and there's other kinds of exotic ideas like that. So I think within 50 years, you know, we'll know what the answer is. Nonetheless, regardless of what 
new configuration of the engine is, you know, there will be significant challenges in materials. What, as we look to the future, though, what, what I have to say is one area that materials has fallen short in the past has been the long time it takes us to do a development. And, and, and so historically, if, if we go with a new class of material, like an intermetallic or even a ceramic matrix composite, the development time is easily 20, more like 30 years. Uh, an example uh, in our business uh, is in titanium luminides, which, which actually program started in the Air Force in the 70s, and only within the last several years have we implemented turbine blades made from titanium luminides. Now, they had great promise even 30 years ago because they were equivalent strength of nickel alloys and, and they had half the weight. And so tremendous payoff in an engine, but there are a lot of other technologies had to be developed in, and we had to have the um, industrial capability to, to make the material on a large scale. So that historically, you know, it takes 20 to 30 years to do a new material. Uh, for the future, that, that will not be true. What, what, what I foresee will be able to do development in one third the time. And, and not only in structural type materials like I've been talking about, but I, I think across the board. And what gives me the, the hope would be, first of all, some personal experience that we've had in doing accelerated programs, on, of course, they're on a selective basis. But I, for the, the first time ever in, in the industry, we developed a new turbine blade alloy and qualified it for flight with the FAA within two years of starting a program. Now, normally that would have been at least a, a six-year program. And what we did is we used some computational tools. And in, importantly, because it was such uh, a key project for our business, you know, we had an integrated team with the design people and the manufacturing people, and, and it worked, you know. And, and it kind of gives us a roadmap for the future, what, what we can do in other areas of materials, kind of following the, the, the same sort of recipe. So I, I, I think in materials, rather than trying to pick, you know, what, are, what will be the big winners in the next 50 years or plus, what I think the big winner is going to be uh, finding a way to develop these computational models and work together as an enterprise to, uh, which, which would include uh, partnering with, um, with the supply chain folks, with, with university and governments, uh, with the government labs, uh, to find ways to select the right material to focus on and then rapidly scale it up into an application of interest, and then, then you would, would, would be off and running. Uh, let's see, this, the, this next chart though shows, let's see, how do I, ah. This next chart shows what, what oftentimes has happened in the past. Why, the, one of the reasons why it's taken us so long to do a materials development, and, and, you've, and you've heard of the valley of death. Well, what, what happens is on, on the um, left side, the materials folks, they think they know the right answer, but uh, they really don't have the buy-in or the support from all the other stakeholders and, and the decision makers. And, and, and so it's almost an adversarial type of, of relationship. And, 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 for, and for good reason, be, because a, a lot is at stake. You know, in, in, uh, aircraft engines cost us one to two billion dollars, for example, to develop a new engine. And if, in, in, and if you have a field problem, uh, it could easily cost in the hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, to solve that problem. So you gotta make sure whatever change you make, you know, that, that you're absolutely right. But, but what we've learned is you don't have to accept that way of doing business. And, and so this approach, um, which is what we've managed to do on a selective basis, you know, is, is much better. And, and so we work as collaborative teams and in, 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 in we're well integrated. Uh, and in, in, in what we should have in mind is to do this approach as uh, ordinary type business rather than on the special case on urgent problems, you know, that, that, that arise. Um, key to being able to have an accelerated program, though, is also being sure that you're right. 
in, in, and so we, we need computational models which are fairly good at predicting what will happen. We need the understanding, say from a more basic science standpoint, of what the degradation modes of these materials would be in, in the application environment. And we need uh, very smart ways to test these materials, and, and which is beyond some of the old standard tests that we have done, which, which turns out are not terribly useful in, in the kinds of high temperatures, high pressure environments, you know, that we encounter now. Uh, we heard yesterday from Eric Schmidt that the key role that the government has had in stimulating the uh, new innovation, and, and this has certainly been the case in computational type materials in, care, in, in also building uh, new characterization type facilities for, for materials. So going forward, I think a coordinated effort by industry, government, and universities, which will no doubt happen in the next 50 years, will be essential to accelerate the development of materials you know, across all the different spectrums of interest. And the reason I say certainly because there's already some of that uh, you know, has happened. Um, now, what, what, what I have one last slide to show, and this is from my old um, job at, at, at GE, where, where I, I actually plotted the work that we did, we, we, we did internally on developing models. And you can see we, um, in, in, in some of these, by the way, are models that, um, that you, you can also purchase but a lot are ones that we built ourselves. <clears throat> so starting around the mid 80s, you know, we, we kind of focused on process models and more of a reactive use to help us solve problems that we were having either at a supplier or problems that we were having in synthesizing some of the ma new materials that we wanted to develop. And, and, and these uh, got uh, further extended in, into predicting the microstructure of the materials. And then if we have a good idea what the microstructure would be, we can predict the properties. And, 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 and so as we've gone forward, um, the slide is a little misleading in the sense um, it looked like we stopped working on process models, but that, that's not true. We've, um, we continue to work on process models and structure models and property models in real time. And um, probably now we have 60, 70 models that, uh, you know, that we currently use in, in, in my business to go help us advance the development of materials. And a lot of these are in the composite area, I should say. So it's, it, you know, it's not just metals that we're interested, though the, what we show here are some of the examples of metals. But, Another thing about the shape of this curve, it's, it's not linear, it, it's exponential. And, and I can only imagine 50 years from now what, what this curve would look like. You know, the, the, I expect there'll be many hundreds of models here. Uh, so therefore, uh, what, what, what I'd say is we, we need um, a collaborative ecosystem, not, not only for the, the experts to work together, uh, on, on solving these problems and developing these materials and quickly finding ways to integrate that to solve problems or satisfy needs. But, but we also need the computational type environment that would be a facilitator for, for the collaboration. And, and that's something, there's a couple elements of that floating around, but I think we're, we're not there at the right answer, but it's certainly within time we have this meeting again in 50 years, that, that'll be a solved problem. So in, in conclusion, what, what I'd say, the future for materials is quite exciting, and regardless of what field of materials that uh, one is interested in, I think we have a pathway to change the paradigm for long development times of materials. And, um, and fully integrate with the others in the engineering disciplines that we work with. And, and at the end of the day, I, I'd say the challenge is there be, because after all, that everything physical is made from some type of a material. So we, we have tremendous opportunity, uh, you know, to, to influence the, um, the, the engineering world. Okay, so thank you very much.
Thank you, Robert. Thank you to all of our remarkable panelists. Uh, it is your good fortune that uh, the time I was going to use for my summary has run out. Um, <laughs> Sort of my good fortune, too, because I, that, that would have been a big job to summarize. Uh, I do need to give you a break. Uh, for the women in the room, take your time. This building was uh, apparently not engineered right, so for the guys who have to use the facilities, I'll see you in about an hour. Um, <laughs> women, come back whenever you want. Uh, we, uh, we, we should take 20, uh, 15 minutes for a break. Uh, so can we meet back here at 11.20, and then we're going to have a little more of a discussion with all of our panelists. Thank you so much. <laughs>